pleasure to have you here on the AM show. This is the news review segment part of, brought to you by Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. And they're offering free prostate screening and fertility screening at their various locations. Here in Accra, they're on the Spintex Road, opposite the Shell signboard. In Kumasi, Kronuma behind the Angel Educational Complex. In Takrade, Anaji Estate. In Tema, Community 22. In Techiman Hanswa, in Esiama in Zima. And you can call them on 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. This morning, both of my guests joined me on Zoom. I have Kojopoku, energy expert, and Dr. Wisdom Dogby, financial analyst, joining me to get into the various stories captured in these newspapers. Gentlemen, welcome aboard. Good morning. Uh, good, good morning, morning. Sorry. My name is Koja. Koja, I haven't actually en encountered you in a bit um, since our last encounter. How, are you, how have you been? <laughs> I've been well. Um, I'm getting a bit of a cold. I'm in Kumasi getting okay. ready for the big day. So we are here. Um, as you can see, I'm not with my usual yellow background. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm out of jurisdiction. Well, it's good to see you. And Doc, it's good to see you too. So I'll start with you, Dr. Dugbe. I'll give you a minute or two to get into whatever is on your mind this morning. What are we um, talking about? So thank you so much for having me again. You know, I'm not uh, for more taxes, right? But this new 5% excise tax, it is one that would have made sense to me if they got the timing right. We need to find ways to reduce uh, plastic waste. There is no argument in my mind about that, right? But I doubt if the true intention behind this new tax, uh, I doubt if this is truly uh, to help with environmental protection. The thing is, our people no longer trust the government on these things. And this tax is at the wrong time, a time when people are already struggling in this economic crisis. Look, everywhere in the world, Sweden, you tax plastic products to discourage their use and to promote more sustainable alternatives. So I'd like to ask, what sustainable alternative has the government proposed and pro promoted so that if the cost of this plastic product is increased, it will incentivize consumers and businesses to choose uh, these eco-friendly alternatives, such as uh, reusable or also biodegradable materials. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking if the government has offered these alternatives. Or maybe the government is pursuing this approach, you know, as an uh, economic incentive for recycling and innovation. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Look, regardless of how you look at it, the impact of such a tax is mainly on uh, lower income households. And I said that because plastic items, such as a single-use uh, pure water satchel bags, right? These are often more affordable options for uh, lower-income consum consumers. You don't always see the wealthy in our society, you know, rolling down their windows in traffic to buy pure water. So this new tax could place uh, an additional financial burden on the lower-income citizens, which further worsens economic inequalities uh, in the nation, Sweden. Okay, thank you, Doc, for that. Um, Kojo Poku, what's on your mind this morning? Well, um, it's a big day for the New Patriotic Party. Um, yeah. Today marks the end of our process. You know, we started a very big process of mm. electing from our grassroots all the way to the flag bearer. And in November 4th, we elected Dr. Mahmoud Baumia as our flag bearer. And he, in turn, as the constitution of the MPP demands, have to elect a running mate, which he did a couple of um, weeks ago. And today we unveil the running mate, Dr. Matthew Opoku Brempe, popularly known as Napo, um, in Kumasi. And it's going to be a mammoth crowd in Kumasi to basically um, witness the unveiling. And after that, we hit the road and basically start the door-to-door, -door, corner corner-to-corner, window-to-window campaign um, in the northern region. So I think um, it's a big day for the party, and I'm looking forward to a very successful day. Yeah, on that note, let's get into the papers. And I'll continue in that line of thought, because on the front page of the Daily Guy newspaper, it says, Baumia presents Napo to Otum for today. Um, NDC, SC parking claims untenable. That is according to Afenyo Markin. GNPC flaws any in $7 billion case. And Okwe shakes Domi Kwabinya. EC Chair IGP pledge credible elections. Let's start with a story that you just gave us, um, Kojopoku, about Baumia, being pre Bauma, Baumia presenting Napo to Otumfo this morning. I'll just read excerpts for context. The New Patriotic Party 
presidential candidate Dr. Mahmoud Balmia will officially introduce his running mate, Dr. Matthew Pogu Prempe, to the Asante Hene Otum Tutu, the second today. Now, according to reports, there would be a grand deborah of chiefs and people of Asante Man and the Nana Efia Kobi Park inside the Misha Palace to welcome the NPP presidential candidate delegation. I'll come back to you, um, Dr. Dogbe, but Kojopoku, what's the significance of presenting the choice of the running mate to Otumfo? You said he'll be unveiled, but the story is saying that he'll be presented to the Otumfo. Just help me gain the significance of this. Okay, so it's tradition. Um, we are Ashantis. Um, in our great land, the law is very simple. Um, the Ashanti tradition has something that says that even if you see an ant in your house, you need to go to Menshia to ask permission before you kill that ant because everything on this land belongs to the store. That's the basic tradition of our land. So if you come onto the Ashanti land to perform any event, to take anything, to anything you want to do on the Ashanti land, the first point of call is to the owner of the land, uh, Utum Falls 82, mm. uh, who sits on a golden stool. So we need to go and perform that um, tradition of presenting his grandchild to him. Um, you pick somebody from this great land to represent, to be the running mate of the party. That person is a representative of the entire country, but also representative of the Akan and Ashanti tradition. So you need to basically go to the traditional leaders and the embodiment of our tradition in the Ashanti region is our great king. Mm. So that is where we need to present his grandchild to him. That Nana, we come, we're taking your son to be our running mate, and we present him to you before you unveil him to the whole of the Ashanti mine. So All we right. need to present him to the, um, the occupier of the golden stool. Dr. Dogwe, any quick thoughts or reflections on this before we go to other stories? So the, I, I just don't think uh, uh, Dr. Napo is really representative of the, 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 the nation of Ghana, right? I mentioned the last time that I didn't know Dr. Uh, Prempe very well, Napo very well, and Kojo made a, a very good point that mm. it is best for me to take time to know him before judging him. And I can show that I took the, the time to ask the folks that matter, I mean the average Ghanaian voter. I asked them to educate me about Napo, and almost all of them use one word, to describe his character, and that one word is arrogance. As I also observed when I, I saw him uh, answering questions on Doomso, and that really confirms my first impression about the man. Mm. And I'll say it again that, in my opinion, he acts as though he was somewhere minding his own business and didn't want anything to do with politics, and Ghanaian sent a delegation to go and beg him to accept a ministerial or uh, political position. I mean, for me, right, his efforts to gaslight the Doomsa situation and his cheeky answer when he was asked for a timetable, I think it, he's still working on fully appreciating uh, the concept of servant leadership, which is something you need, to, you, you need very much you know, to succeed in most leadership settings. You have to demonstrate uh, humility, sweetie, and the ability to take responsibility for things that have gone south under your watch. And I think he doesn't have... Uh, that uh, trait very much. He doesn't succeed at these uh, basic traits of a servant leader. And I think he's out of touch with the reality of the average Ghanaian, uh, as he showed clearly when he didn't see the need for a doomsaw uh, timetable, when he attempted to spin the doomsaw situation. So I'm all for tradition. If they should unveil him, they should visit us and to any. Mm. I think that's all tradition. But as far as representation of the Ghanaian people, I don't quite see how uh, Napo uh, fits into that, that view. Okay, so I'm, I guess this is the first that we'll see of NAPO 2.0. <laughs> this is a new NAPO that is going to be well, unveiled. And now, so going you know, into the, the elections the, the this year, thing, so, uh, can I what were you saying? Quickly? I said the most important thing we have to take away from this is that yeah. what my brother just said is his personal opinion. And oh, yeah, um, yeah. He, sits up, he sits afar and um, he's judging. And I don't think... You can ask people about someone and claim you know the person. People's opinion of people differ. So I don't know who he's been talking to, but look, um, the man, what we need as a, in the, in, as a nation, what we need is somebody with the energy and the knowledge to move this country forward. And then we have that in Dr. Macho Paul Kuprempe. Right. But he did say, oh, I'm, just, I'm just quickly, reiterating. Sorry, let me react to that very okay, quickly. Okay, go ahead. Very quickly. But I think it is very hard to try to... Uh, 
separating that poor from arrogance, right? It doesn't but nobody, matter where But I nobody's say, doing that. Nobody's doing quickly, that. Quickly, quickly, let, let me explain this. Let me quickly explain this. If you watch Guinean TV, if you read the news, there is just one word that everybody is using to describe uh, Napo, and that word is arrogance. I did not make this stuff up, right? It's all over the news, and that's how Ghanaian see him. And I think that <sighs> for him to make any impact on the ticket with Baumia, that narrative has to change pretty quickly. I think a lot of Ghanaians know him as a, a pretty arrogant man. From far, okay. from afar. When he hits the road and he gets to the people and do the door to door, the bed to bed, people will see a different type of Dr. Manjo of Good Prepare. But from I'll, afar, everybody has their own opinion. I would like to see that. Okay, let's get into the papers now. I'll start with, uh, you know what, I have a couple of papers with me. So I'll get through um, the Daily Guide newspaper, touch on some quick headlines, and then do three major stories, and then I'll come to you for your reflection. So follow me. Um, of course, there's a story about Baumia presents Napoto Tun for today. EC and IGP pledge credible elections, that is ahead of elections 2024 in December. How to discover the secrets of God, this is an editorial, at, la at last a running mate. I mean, we've had this tease for a while, and so finally, he will be unveiled today. Russia fires dozens of missiles across Ukraine. West African bloc risk disintegration if Juntas quit. Alleged starvation court leader goes on to actually want to get into the story from, on ECOWAS because it concerns us. Um, the West African bloc, ECOWAS, has warned that it risks disintegration and Western insecurity after Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger formalized their breakaway union. The head of the ECOWAS commission said the move was a major blow to the 50-year-old bloc and could have serious consequences if they do not reverse their decision. And it comes after the military leaders of these three countries said on Saturday that they were irrevocably turning their backs on the 15-member ECOWAS to form a confederation of their own state. Please note that I'll come back to you for your reflections when um, I'm done get, going through the papers. NDC, Supreme Court parking claims untenable, and that is Akwenyo Markin. <laughs> so the majority caucus in parliament has dismissed claims by the Opposition National Democratic Congress that the government is parking the Supreme Court. It comes after the NDC accused President Okufuado of packing the apex court following the recommendation of additional five ju justices by Chief Justice Gedru Tokono. However, speaking to the media and parliaments yesterday, the majority caucus, led by Apenyo Markin, described the NDC's accusation as untenable. Just to quote what he said, it is instructive to note that since independence, we've allowed institutions to grow. Even before 2019, Ghana had only 10 regions, and that is to support the claim or the Chief Justice's defense of the need for uh, more, supreme, more justices in the Supreme Court. Government to set up road maintenance app, call center, Okwe Sheikh's Domi Kwabinya, Abana Sayasari encourages BEC candidates. Today is day two of this um, basic education certificate examination. And the member of parliament for Itiwa East constituency in the eastern region, Abana Sayasari, has asked students writing the BEC to do their best to pass well. And according to where the students need to show appreciation to a Kufado led government for providing infrastructure and other relevant materials to ensure that they get quality education. I mean, the controversy surrounding whether or not the, this particular examination has the needed funding they need is also another question. But yesterday we heard um, on Newsnight about some mysterious events happening and things that medicine could not explain. I don't know if you follow the story, but it looks like there are some powers that be that are obstructing the progress of some students sitting this examination. Senate justifies hotel sale. EIB clears Sewami here on leaked sex video. I've thought of joining Freemason, that is an, um, DJ Kapi, Nigerian musician. Let me do the story on Snits justifying hotel sale because yesterday we heard Kofi Boson Pemo um, justifying why they need to actually let this happen. The Social Security and National Insurance Trust has justified its decision to sell 60% shares of its hotels to Rock City Hotel. Speaking at a press briefing yesterday in Accra, Director General of SNIT, Kofi Bosumpe Mosafo Mafo, said selling the stake to the Rock City Hotel was the last option as its hotels failed to pay dividends but consistently made losses. Quote, these hotels are capital intensive businesses. They require continuous capital expenditure. SNIT doesn't have the necessary funding to do that as the businesses have been making consistent losses. And he goes on to say that a number of um, 
I think you said 20 million or 200 million so far has been injected into recovering or restructuring the hotels, but to no avail. And so their best option right now is to sell them. I'll pause here for your quick reflections. Um, on the back page of the Daily Guide newspaper, Noama Lance um, Lion Permanence Deal. And uh, match fixing referee for England Netherlands game, Ronaldo not quitting now. Those are just some stories from the world of sports. Gentlemen, I'll start with you, Kojokoku. Well, um, let's start from the where you ended up. Oh, no, the snakes um, conversation hmm. is a two prone approach. You need to have two conversations. The first question everybody should ask themselves is that should these hotels be sold? Um, let's put aside who is in the middle or in the midst of trying to buy it. Have anybody visited any of these hotels and has seen the state that they are in? And is there a need for private sector participation? The question, sorry, the answer to that question is 100%. SNIT can no longer keep up those hotels. SNIT cannot be using people's pension funds to basically piss it down the drain. So there's a need for a private sector in, uh, um, participation. This conversation has been going on as far back as 2017 when my, I have an investment company an African capital that has been in the midst of this process when my big uncle, um, Mr. Gedilai, was the chairman of the, of the what do you call it, the, the consortium, the, the arm that owns these hotels. SNET is only the investor. Mm. Um, the most important thing is now that we agree that the hotels need to be sold, then the next question is who is it to be sold to? If a Ghanaian has the money to buy it, why not? We, we tend to like bastardizing um, Ghanaians who are well-to-do to do some of these things. Yes, there's a question mark on my brother, um, the Agri minister, who sits as a minister but has private wealth. Um, nobody can say that uh, Brian's money was when he came in government. Brian has got private wealth before MPP came into power. So um, that conversation is subject to debate. Um, can a certain minister who has private wealth acquire um, an, an asset? Um, if the law allows it, why not? I Does think it, we should though? Really... Well, we don't, I don't know what the law says. I mean, I honestly don't know what the law says, but the money, is, the, the, there are two, like I said, there are different conversations. If you strip it away from the emotions, where there's politics involved, why is Brian the one to buy? If it needs to be sold. And it's a Ghanaian called Brian Echampo who has his own money to buy. I mean, Brian, uh, Mr. Brian Echampo, Honorable Brian Echampo, has sat in various positions as deputy minister and minister. But his wealth, how much money Brian has, predates 2017. So everybody can check that, and it's a fact. Okay. So with that said, how is it that it's a problem? It's not like he's somebody who didn't have anything, all of a sudden made money and is trying to acquire asset from SNIT. And SNIT is only an investor, okay? And if SNIT is selling its shares, there are so many um, shareholders of those hotels. Some uh, in the central region have Atuahoy them as shareholders. So what's wrong if they acquired it when they were in government? So what's wrong with if Brian Champon has money to acquire? So for okay. me, that is how I see it. I don't think we should basically flood it with the politics that we are doing and let those institutions, sorry, those hotels be sold because they really need... Um, the dire investment. I, will, I slept in the Elmina Beach Resort about three weeks ago, and it's horrible. It needs to be sold. They need right. private sector investment. <clears throat> Major, before you, before, the, before you, you proceed, just two quick thoughts. I cannot verify this private wealth of um, Bernie Champong that you talk about, but the question or the argument really what do you mean? from... What, what from, do you mean let, you cannot can I, verify just, it? Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Me... Before you go on, what do you mean by you cannot verify it? Uh, I didn't think you can verify it. How do you verify Kojo, it? I'm asking you the question. I let you, I let you give your submission. I'm just, I'm just probing okay. something. So you let me land okay. and then you come in. Okay. Thank you. Go on. So what I'm saying to you is that, as I said here, this private mm -hmm. wealth that you talk about, I cannot confirm mm -hmm. to our viewers. But... When you say that, or I was trying to tell you that the argument from organized labor, even from the man who's been leading this charge, um, Okuje Tuablakwa, is that if this man who is a certain member of cabinet knows how to turn around these hotels, why doesn't he suggest it to cabinet? I mean, that's the very role that cabinet plays. It, it, no, 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 no. Rather no, no, than, no, no. Rather than about, using this ideas. private it's wealth to it's purchase it. Uh, um, Mr. Abuchi, let's, let's have this conversation. Look. It's not about ideas to tell government. It's about money. 
Mm. You need money. The tiles are coming off. What idea do you fix a tile that is coming off? So what about the what about the issues so let, or let the conflict of let interest? Then you've asked, you've asked the, you, there's no conflict of interest. Okay. And let me put this on record: conflict of interest is not a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, the minute you declare the conflict of interest, it is declared, and it, everybody moves on. Mm. So there is no certain a conflict of interest being a crime. Everybody knows that Rock City is owned by Brian Champon. If he declares that, we move on. When you say that somebody sits in cabinet and should give government the idea, what idea? Roger, I'm really surprised that what you say that conflict of interest. No, but hold on. Like it's about it. money. Hold on. What, what are you surprised okay, about? Tell so, me. So, yeah, let you... me explain. Mm. All right. I'll let, yeah, I'll let, I'll let, no, no, Dr. Adogwe, go ahead. Look, I'm really surprised that you say conflict of interest is not a crime. Whether it is a crime or not, is that really acceptable? But in one breath, you say it's not a crime. Whether it's a crime or not, tell me if it's a crime or it's not a crime. Is conflict Pedro, of interest a crime? Pedro, this is the this is the deal. Would is conflict you accept of interest a crime? Please, of let's interest. address this. Is conflict you, of interest a crime? Run, let's address that and move on. Look, there is a reason everywhere in this world. Is conflict of interest a crime? Let's address that and move on. Is conflict of interest a crime? Pedro, I would put that to the lawyers, right? As far as the legal questions are co concerned, I put that to the lawyers. But it is very shocking to me that everywhere in this world, wherever you work, whether in politics or in the corporate world, there is a reason why organizations go the extra mile to invest in training for the employees to avoid conflict of interest mm. and the appearance thereof. So I, I find it very uh, confusing for you to sit on TV and say that conflict of interest is not a crime, and so for that matter, it is acceptable. Is that really acceptable to, uh, acceptable to you? Is that what you're saying? That really okay, so let, now that you've asked that question, and let me stress this quickly. There was a transaction that happened in Ghana by the World Bank. IFC, the International Finance Corporation, was an investor and a sponsor of that transaction. There were three companies that were bidding for this same transaction that the World Bank through IFC was sponsoring. And, and IFC, at the same time, was shareholders in all those two of the three companies during the media transaction. Do you know what happened? IFC just put a disclaimer to basically um, announce the conflict of interest because IFC was a shareholder of the two of the companies that were bidding all right, for all right. that transaction. All right, Koju. As long as, you declare, yeah. as long as you declare the conflict, it is no longer an issue. So then we, need, we need to use your platform to educate folks yes. well, right? I don't, so, I don't think this is the right be, Dr. Adogwe, before, before, of of be, Dr. Adogwe, before you come in, Kojo, I think our issues with this sale to the person in question is about procurement breaches, it's about his position as a cabinet minister, and it's about the way he intends to pay. You want to take over these hotels, use it or turn it around, make some money, and then pay us, you know, spread the payment over a period of time. But those, like you said, they're subject to debate. And I get, I get that you, you know what? You can finish your, your thoughts on the other stories. Let's move on from this story because okay. time will not so, allow so us. And then the, we, the other I'll go conversation to that Dubai. you bring up, which is the, 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 the mode of payment, that's a conversation we can all have. But like I said, we need to separate the issues. Anyway, on the ECOWAS issue, I think that if Mali is to come out of ECOWAS, for me, for sentimental reasons, I'll be very sad. You know, ECOWAS started, and Krumah, when he wanted to start... Um, in ECOWAS, only three companies was um, willing to join. That's why initially it was Ghana, Guinea, Mali. So ECOWAS, the first three members of ECOWAS was Ghana, Guinea, and Mali. So Mali is the very one of the first proponents of ECOWAS unity. And if they are to come out for me, I think um, the leaders that we have now to bring everybody, the Niger, the Burkina, to a round table to find a solution towards um, how they can still remain as echo in the ECOWAS block. Right. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the credible election that we want to have. I think uh, it goes without saying that the EC and police have vowed that we are going to have the most credible election in Afghanistan's history. Thank you. Thank you, Kojo. Dr. Adogbe, it's your take, your take now. Well, I don't understand why a country like the United States of America, right, with a population of over 333 million plus people, with, with a larger landmass, such a big country has only nine justices in the Supreme Court. And if my memory serves me right, the U.S. has only 25 cabinet secretaries, mm. what we call ministers in Ghana. 
Then turn your attention to Ghana, a small nation with a population of only 10% of the population of the United States. Yet we have so many ministers. And how many justices of the Supreme Court are already in counting? I understand the Constitution of Ghana mentioned that there should be a minimum of nine justices or judges, mm. and it's pretty mom on the on the maximum. But I don't think it's prudent to take advantage of that silence of the Constitution and part the court. Look, I don't contest that more judges on the nation's highest court could help improve the caseload if the Supreme Court is overwhelmed with too many cases. Maybe this could potentially uh, help distribute the caseload and also allow for more efficient case management. But my comment on this is more to provoke thought, right? Mm. On uh, uh, more than an authoritative synopsis of why or why not, you know, the Supreme Court should add more judges. I just don't think that we should be adding more judges to, you know, cure uh, the inefficiencies in the highest court of the land, especially if there are other factors that impact the performance of the court. Can we learn a thing or two from the United States? Why does the U.S. get a job done with only nine justices for the last 250 plus years? Should we further decentralize, right, the judicial setup a bit more so that some of these cases can be handled at the state or regional levels? I don't know the answer to this. I'm just asking. Mm. But you see, uh, because these judges are appointed by, uh, by the president, Sweden, I hope the nation goes about it very carefully to prevent, you know, the appearance of uh, over -polit uh, politization of the nation's uh, highest court. I think there should be a better process of uh, appointing these judges so that one president alone doesn't get to appoint too many judges to the court. Otherwise, I think it could undermine the independence and also the fairness and integrity of the jud judicial arm, and the public confidence and trust could be lost if the party in power stacks the court with too many, you know, ideologically aligned judges. The risk in this case is a situation where the nation, you know, uh, I think that you get a, a court that is politicized uh, to the extent that people no longer trust the court. I, right. I worry about that aspect. Mm. All right, let's go to the daily graphic now. Oh, Siri, before yeah. you continue, can I make a quick point from yes, what my Yes, I've been told I have see? limited time, so make it brief. No, I, I, I'll be brief. When okay. people talk about the United States having nine justices in the Supreme Court, they refuse to add that that's the federal Supreme Court. There are 50 states that all have Supreme Courts. Mm. So it's like in Ghana, every region having a Supreme Court. Now, right. in, in states like Texas and Oklahoma, they have two Supreme Courts each. In Texas, there are two Supreme Courts, one for civil cases and one for criminal cases. So between Oklahoma and Texas, there's four Supreme Courts. So please, don't come and lecture us about the American situation. It's different from what we have. America has yeah. 50, 54, no, no, America has 54 Supreme Courts at the state level. So don't come and combine. But compare I, don't think he was, I don't think he was comparing America no, to Ghana. Yeah, yeah, no, he when I that's said when he was comparing. Eric Kalele. That's when he's comparing. How can listen, you tell listen. me about the ninth justice system? Okay, okay so Kojo, you've made your points. Let him, let him get a chance to respond and then we can move on. Did you hear me say this very clearly that maybe should we decentralize? And I also ask this, what can we learn from the United States? Mm. Nobody is saying in any way, shape and form that the United States system should be replicated and gathered. Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. But is there anything that we can learn from the U.S. system? Okay. That is the question. So instead, the question. Of having, so instead of having 15 Supreme Court at Accra, we should have 16 regions of Supreme Court and have nine each. How much would that total? I'll go to the Daily Graphic now, gentlemen. On the front page, on election 2024, police on alerts to troublemakers. I think alerts on troublemakers. Slippers land BEC candidates in trouble. NDC to establish anti-corruption mechanism. That is according to Mahama. I mean, coming from his press engagement on Sunday. And let's get into the stories now. I'll start with the story on police on alerts. I think it's the same story we just did with IGP and EC um, saying that they are committed to ensuring free and fair elections in, 20, in December this year for this election. ECOWAS decries lack of progress with Junta State. We've just got into that story. Liberian president cut salary by 40%. Is there anything we can learn from that? <laughs> no, BEC candidates, say again. 
There's a lot yeah, of I, I will come to you, gentlemen. I will come to you. That was just a rhetorical question. Draw edge sword, navigating life as a child of business uh, um, of a business owner. I will race to end. Yeah, that's Joe Biden saying that he's clearly not stepping away. He's going to run this race till the end. I mean, despite the weaknesses that we've seen in his um, oratory or in his performance at that debate that was held last week or last two weeks, he says he will thrive forward. Exhaling for Napo, navigating life. Let me do this story, and then there was a story that caught my attention. I'm trying to find it. Yeah, Slippers land BEC candidates in trouble. I realize that in all our submission, we haven't yet talked about BEC, and it's very important. These children are writing this examination. The dreams of 12 basic education certificate examination candidates of obtaining their first academic certificate nearly turned into a nightmare when they were almost barred from writing the first paper yesterday at Ho Kabori Junior High School Center for wearing slippers instead of prescribed cross sandals. To their surprise, the unsuspecting pupils were reprimanded on arrival at the examination center and instructed to go home after the English paper and come back better dress for the religious and moral education paper in the afternoon. What, what are your thoughts on this um, in terms of prescribed attire to sit an examination? Dr. Duke, well, there's a uniform. Well, there's a uniform for a reason. And I think um, for us to um, not conflict these issues, we are all told, and it's been the tradition, you come to the examination hall in the uniform. If you go to school in a certain uniform, that's the uniform you come to write exams in. I don't think it's anything new. We are we are trying to blur the lines in in certain issues. Um, if slippers or um, chaliwate or whatever it is is allowed in school, then that should be allowed in the examination hall. Okay. But bear in mind, to go and write a paper, you are actually going in as a student, and you mm. should be you should be in uniform. I like that you said we should be in uniform. Do you think that these children, these candidates, it is a question of that they want to flounce the rules or because they cannot afford to buy the appropriate, um, the prescribed attire? That okay, they so well, did, they, did they come back in their sandals and all the time they've been going to school, have they been wearing sandals or they've been going to school on barefoot? The, the story should tell us that. All right, I don't so, think they've been going to school on barefoot or they've been going to school in Chaliwate. Hold Look, from no longer ago. My okay. grandfather, my mm -hmm. father went to school barefooted. Okay, mm -hmm. most of our fathers went to school barefooted. Um, I, I think the last born in my dad's line is the only person who was the first person to be by to be bought a sandals going to school. Most of his elder siblings went to school barefooted. So look, um, I don't think it's an issue here. Um, All right, if you hold, go hold to for me. Barefooted, you, okay. Hold for me. Dr. Dogbe, that's a question I'm posing to you as well. Is it a question of affordability or is it just recalcitrant behavior? Do you think? So the, I, your I don't believe that. I, I, don't, I, I agree with Kojo that there is a code of conduct, there is a code of dress, and that you must comply with that. But Kojo saying that coming, they came back in shoes or in the proper footwear, that doesn't mean that they own it, right? Kojo, they could have gone to... <laughs> borrow that uh, to wire and come and write the exams because the exams is more important. You can't say that definitively. You and I, we don't know that for a fact, right? So I, 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 like, I like your train of thought. <laughs> you, you can't say that for a fact. Look, I grew up at home. This, this uh, uh, incident happened at home, so it really matters to me a lot. But I can tell you for a fact, a lot of people where I grew up, home in the water region of Ghana, a lot of folks struggled to be uh, to afford the basic things, right? The basic uh, things like a uh, school uniform, attire, uh, all those things. So we should really ask the question: Were they in a position to afford this? Did their parents have the ability to buy these things for them, or they had to go write the exams because they they they, they needed these exams to go to SHS in in, in the first place? All but right. Sudi, I would like to digress and go and talk about uh, the the Biden story. If if you're done with this one, yes, yes, yes. Look, I think President Biden may be dangerously detached from the reality at this point. There is no sugar code in what we all saw on the debate stage, right? Mm. Joe Biden had a terrible debate, and in my opinion, he's proven the doubters and those uh, who say that he's too old. He's proven them right. And I think it's time for him and his uh, family and also the DNC to do some uh, really deep introspection if he's still the right candidate to lead a party into the, the November 7th elections. Look, I'm one of the few Christians here in America 
who would rather not have anything to do with former President Trump. The man acts like a court leader. He has morals mm. of an alley cat, as Joe Biden accurately uh, describing him during the debate. He's a pathological liar. He cares nothing about his country by himself. He's everything I wouldn't want my son to ever become. Yeah, I think that he's fooled the church into believing he's some form of a savior sent by God to save America. I was just so appalled when I saw uh, some Christians, including pastors, comparing someone like Trump to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So in all fairness, I will vote for a Lord before I ever vote for Trump. I could, I could have voted for uh, Mike Pence if he was the, the nom nominee. Mm. And it beats my mind when the church largely uh, rejects a man like Pence who demonstrates Christian values more than Trump. Pence's only crime, his only crime is uh, he put the U.S. Constitution above loyalty to Trump. Right. And even the church wouldn't forgive him for this, and I don't get that. Look, okay. I'm pro-life, and I believe in the Second Amendment of the, the Constitution. So some of us are presented with very tough choices for this election. And I must say that I may even end up write, writing in Mike Pence as my choice when I vote. But back to Joe Biden quickly. I think he ran for president to deliver the U.S. from the chaos of uh, Trump's presidency, and he did just that. I think if he still cares about the United States of America, and if he wants to keep Trump far, far away from the, the White House, the noble thing for him to do is to withdraw so other competent foes can, can take this loser, I mean Trump on, and defeat him once and for all. Okay, thank you for those thoughts there. We just have a couple of minutes to go. So let's do the new Finder newspaper now, and I'll rush through it. And if any of these stories catch your attention that you want us to get into, you can draw my attention. On the front page, Blaze Bid failed at first stage. I will adjust IMF agreements, that is ex-president Mahama. Official creditor committee approves Ghana's deal with Eurobond holders. APN pushes for seamless mobile transactions in Africa. Five companies submit bids to redevelop Saglemi. And that's a story I want to start with. Kojopon Nkrumah has been saying some things, and it's on page nine. I will get to it now. So the long store Saglemi housing project will soon see new life as five companies have submitted bids for its redevelopment. The bids received by Minister of Works and Housing in Accra following a request for proposal marked a significant step towards completing the project, which has been plagued by delays and controversies since its inception. Now, the bidders for the project are Afro Arab Properties Limited, Quam LMI Consortium, Dredge Masters Titanium, Bro Ghana Limited, and Macetilene Group. Notably, Okay, these are so addressing journalists during the bid opening ceremony, the Minister for Works and Housing, Kojo Ponkuma, provided an overview of the project's history and the government's efforts to bring it to completion. Um, put a pin in that. I will adjust IMF agreement. Ex President Mahama is saying that. So he's assuring that his government would not cancel the program with the IMF. Instead, the president said he would adjust the agreement and he made these. Um, pledges during the maiden media encounter with um, journalists just last Sunday. He emphasized the importance of mitigating the adverse effects of the IMF conditions while maintaining the program to ensure economic stability and progress for Ghana. Gentlemen, we have to go. So just your reflections on these two stories and then we go. Well, I, I find it very difficult when the journalists were assembled and threw former president low, 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 low blows. Um, I think there has somebody should have asked him what would he yeah of course what would he have done what would he do to adjust he, I mean the rhetoric is not acceptable in this election look he's talking ah. about anti-corruption hold on let me finish mm. he's talking about anti-corruption what what closing the ban when the horses are bolted I mean when are you going to do anti-corruption we're president for four years we didn't see any anti-corruption stance or acts or action from you you are now proposing there's this thing I keep saying there's a picture on social media where a fox is standing there looking at sheep and telling them that if you vote for me, I will be a vegetarian. Mm, the fox you. are talking. The fox is talking, right? The sheep are looking at the fox. They're not listening to what he's saying. It's the, the image of the fox that is in their head. When President Mahama speaks, it's his image that is in the head of Ghanaians. It's not what he says. Because he was president for four years, and we know what he did. Okay. So all this rhetoric of, I will do this, I will do this, what Ghanaians are seeing is the image of President John Mahama, not what he's saying. I guess we can say same for Dr. Mahmoud Balmia. 
or he would he's, never been president. he's also he's never saying been the president. things that hold on for you. Kojo, Kojo, you need to wait calm down. We are president. having a conversation. No, so Dr. Mahmoud Baumia has also wait for him to be president in four years. So in his capacity, in his capacity as vice president, I know that he's done that analogy about being a, the, a driver's not, mate and not the my, actual my, driver. My, my sister. My sister, Doctor, Doctor Dogbe, your, your quick thoughts and then we move on. If you don't want us to have a conversation, I have to move on. Doctor Dogbe, your thoughts and then we can go. No, sweetie, the image that is stuck in the minds of Ghanaians is what it, uh, impacts them from an economic perspective. The last eight years versus the economic situation when uh, Mahama was president. This is very simple, right? Nobody, I don't think that Ghanaians, Ghanaians don't need uh, uh, folks to tell them what to do. They can compare the economic situation under both uh, administrations, and that is the image that will, uh, that will stick in their minds, and that is the image that they will take into the voting booth. Now, on the Seglami project, right? Right. Is this, uh, is this in addition to the amount of money that was already spent and that thing was left to rot in the bush? You see, something is wrong with us as a nation. A nation where one president starts a project and a new president comes in and they are not willing to complete that because they, they don't want the other president to take credit for it. Right. We should change our mindset. We should change the thinking, the way we think about these things. Mm. We should pursue policies that are in the best interest of the people and care very little about who takes credit, who did free SHS, who did Saglami project. That All of that is the reason why Ghana is where we are today. Thank you so much, Dr. Wisdom, Dr. Dr. financial Can analyst, and Kojo Poku is energy expert. Gentlemen, that's all the time we have for the news review segment. Hopefully we can continue this another time. Thank you for joining us.